Namaste, everyone, and good morning to you all. Master, if you permit, we will introduce uh, panel members first, and then um, however you want, if you like to address us and or ask, let them ask questions. Is it okay if I introduce them, Master? Please. Okay. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Rizwan Ali. He's the medical director of the Pinnacle Treatment from Virginia. And his wife, Dr. Sarwat Jahra. She is an ER physician and she is a gazelle poet. Uh, really? Dr. Thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Badia Wazid. She's a retired professor at Virginia Tech. Dr. Badia, if you can unmute and say hello to Daji. <clears throat> he was here. She got lost, I think. I don't see her. She was here and think she probably lost her connection. We'll introduce her later, Master. Miss Anna Dunn, she is from Virginia as well, and she's fluent in her Spanish, and she will be assisting us in Spanish countries, Master. Oh, lovely. And Thank you. Miss Tanvi Arekapudi, she is 17 years old and just took her third sitting yesterday. And she's already an author promoting mental health in teens. She wrote a book called Uplift Teens. Tanvi, you can unmute and say hello to Daji. Thank you for the opportunity, Daji. You're quite welcome, Tanvi. And we, from the Telugu community, we have Mrs. Avanti Jasti. Avanti, if you can unmute. Thank you for the opportunity, Daji. And Umagaru too. Thank you. Miss Neelima Kodanda, also from the Telugu community. Neelima, if you can unmute and convey your pronouns to Daji. Namaste, Daji. Namaste, Neelima Garo. So those are the members of the panel, Master. Do you have any message for us before we proceed with questions and answers? We would love to hear from you. Well, well, well. Today, the Tamil New Year, and we shoot for a lot of people from Kerala. So if some of them are joining my best pieces to all of them, I've been wondering <clears throat> on the purpose of life. Most common question that is, you know, being thrown at us is, what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? Is it accidental? who created this universe, etc., etc., etc. There are no simple answers for all this. Suppose you, you know, children ask such questions. Papa, mommy, you made us. You know, children ask like that. Who made you? Then you say grandpa and grandma. And then who made you? And this <clears throat> uh, retro inquiry goes on forever. And when you say God made all of but then the final question would be who made God? And why did God make such a mistake of creating this imperfect universe? <laughs> why people are suffering? You know, if God created it, why there are so many defects in his creation? So all these questions are thrown at us, but there are no simple answers, I said. One Philosophical approach to it would be <clears throat> God created with the confidence. He gave us the total freedom, free will. And each one of us have been using our free will. Even when the God speaks from within, sometimes we listen. Most of the time we don't listen. We put a stone over our heart and say, keep quiet. Let me do what I have to do. I love these things. I want to indulge with these things because it gives me so much of joy and so much of pleasure. God doesn't speak much after that. He had already given you the signal between right and wrong. 
the heart has always spoken louder, especially when something is not to be done. And often we get this uh, uh, signal from inside of when we go astray, when we are about to make a wrong decision, heart speaks louder. But when we are making a correct decision, correct thing, heart doesn't speak much. Because it's natural. It is how it expects it to be. Only when things go unnatural, it speaks to us. It's almost like this: my, when my eyesight is good, I eat something and my stomach is not upset. My heart doesn't say, oh, your stomach is not upset, so you're in a good health. No. But the moment something goes wrong and I get these symptoms, it gives me signal. Signal that it is unnatural. Something is not right in your system. The same thing happens at a mental level, at the emotional level, at the spiritual level. Ultimate purpose is the negation. Most people may not be able to understand what this negation I am trying to hint. There are many traditions, especially in Sufism. There are grades of dissolutions. Number one grade of dissolution is moving away from your kalb, pulls and pushes of your heart. How to remain steady with that? Even Gita talks about the same thing. Talks about sthit pragya state. Sufism talks about fana e fana. They both are hinted towards the same thing with a different vocabulary. Now, what is after this? What is after sthita pragya? What is the use, the purpose of steady wisdom? Or having arrived at fana, what is the next state? Then the idea comes that the absolute merger in the ultimate, it's like the raindrop falling in the ocean the soul merging with the ultimate becomes the ultimate. It's like the raindrop falling in the ocean, becoming the ocean. And there is no individual left to say, I exist. You have become the ocean now. Ocean can say something, but now drop can't say anything anymore because the individual identity is lost. And that's what bakai baka means. Where earlier, fana e fana, fana means your individual ego is dissolved. Yet your self still exists. Where even this self dissolves and annihilated somehow, then you have arrived at a state called negation. Now, is this negation possible without surrender? It's not possible. We have to let go of so many things, including the self. So other things are just toys to get rid of. How long will you keep playing with your toys? And is surrender possible without acceptance? Is acceptance of the other, maybe a beloved or of God? Is it possible without love? Is love possible without trust? Is the trust possible without experiencing the other? Is this experience possible without action? your practice. So everything boils down to your consistent daily practice. Often people say, do your practice, perform your practice, practice with love, etc. 
you must surrender and then practice. No, surrender is not a means. Surrender is the result. Love is an outcome. Trust is an outcome. Experience is an outcome of our day-to-day -day consistent, rigorous practice. So this is all what I wanted to share with you today, that if we really want to evolve, only way is practice. And practice, I have said with you a number of times that it is morning meditation, where we invite the grace from above in our hearts. The prayerful heart and say, my Lord, I'd like to experience your presence. And the journey begins with that experience. In the evening, when we come back home from our daily routine, or most of the work is over at home, we can sit quietly and get rid of all the accumulations of the garbage that we collect day in and day out. Right? We interact with so many people during daytime. <clears throat> Knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or unconsciously, we go on collecting. Even when you do not want to participate in something, yet you will be able to, you will unnecessarily accumulate some impression. For example, you are watching TV. And there is a movie. Either it is a very romantic movie. Then what happens as a romantic movie reminds of what you don't have, perhaps. Or what you could be better at. And you begin to compare. You're watching a TV. And then they advertise a car. And there is a model. Sometimes this advertisement, does, you can't understand whether they're advertising the model or the vehicle or the object that they It's very difficult to discriminate between the object and the subject there on the TV in advertisement. And you start liking something or disliking something. It is just digital thing. One minute it is there, next minute it's not there. Yet the attraction or repulsion gets deposited in our heart. The feelings, what we see, what we hear, they get ultimately translated into feelings. And when we react with them, either I with liking or disliking, then the idea comes, oh, I have to possess that. I have to do it that way. And that becomes a burden to all of us. We carry this unnecessary thing with us. You are in the office. You had some argument with someone. And what happens? You create automatically a bias towards that person. Even when that person says sorry. But moment we come home and try to understand the situation, Maybe I was at fault. And as we say in India, you cannot clap hand, <laughs> single hand. You know, you need a second hand. So you were already a part of that, the whole game. So find out where you missed out and created a problem for yourself. So there is always a moment of introspection and a moment of taking a back seat and reflect on it, how I could have avoided certain things or certain things which I did very well, but how I can improve them next time. So there is a continuous uh, push from within to refine myself all the time. So meditation, cleaning, and at bedtime before we finally sleep, we have to make peace with ourselves and say, oh, my Lord, 
forgive me for all the things that I have done unconsciously. So I used to ask my master, you know, that why Lord has to forgive you for the things that you did unconsciously. What about the things that you did consciously? <laughs> Meaning, you are aware of what you are going to do and you still purposefully did it. He said, you have to pay the price for that because you did it intentionally. But something that you did unconsciously, you can beg for forgiveness. And that is fine, see. And when we can make peace with ourselves in our heart and invite the Lord, you know, I used to do and I still do it often. I imagine for a moment that I'm sleeping in my mother's lap and this mother is my God or the God is my mother. And it, it puts you to sleep instantly. It gives you so much of solace. And your sleep will also be so deep. Try it out. See what happens when you have this imagination that I am sleeping in the lap of God. And because of this sentiment, <clears throat> the nature of sleep changes. And when we wake up in the morning, that wakeful state will also be so of refreshing. You will feel, yes, I had a complete sleep. You know, often we find, even though we have slept, yet the sleep is lingering because it is incomplete. And life's problems are because of incompleteness in everything that we do. I should have expressed my love completely to my beloved. I did not do it. I could have cooked this meal completely, but I did not cook it completely. I could have performed my worship completely, but I cut short and say, okay, leave it like this. I could have ironed my shirt completely, but I did it halfway. Imagine what happens to your shirt when you go to office, half ironed shirt. <laughs> you look ugly. You look careless. And same thing happens with our emotions. Each time we leave our work halfway, these are the things that haunts all our life. Incomplete tasks. I have often said, when anchor asked me, Kamlesh Bhai, what is your biggest regret? So I said my biggest regret that I could have pressed my mother's feet, I could have caressed her head, I could have loved her more. Instead, I hired nurses and caretakers. Of course, they do their part, but I could have also done my part. I could have been more loving, more caring, with words, with touch, and things like that. So be available all the time. Such regrets, incomplete tasks, they haunt you till you die. And who knows? It haunts us in next life also. So we have to complete our tasks in this life itself. Otherwise, we are recycled. The soul is recycled for perfection. So I have, whatsoever I do in this life has to be completed in a perfect manner. Otherwise, nature you know, cannot accept incomplete parts in her machinery. See, It throws it out and says, now you become perfect and then join me. So anyway, I can go on and on and now let's Tackle some of your questions. We begin with Tanvi. Tanvi, you just finished your settings. Jai Shri Kama um, Daji. So um, my question is, how can we help 
those youth who are feeling um, who don't believe in themselves in their journey and how can we support them through that? <clears throat> this believing is always a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you believe everything your mother tells you? Yeah. Well, you do that. That's very nice. Yeah. You're one exceptional dude I've seen today. <laughs> <laughs> do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Means what? I do, yeah. You do, okay. Why do you believe in God? Um, Like you said, the creator of everything. And that's how I believe, like, whenever we ask God for something or thank God, we get that feeling and we get the empowerment. How do you know God created all this? That's the, um, that's still a question, but that's what I think. And that's what, um, based off a lot uh -huh. of things that I've heard as well, I believe. Okay. And if you ask your parents, you know, what would they say? Or your grandparents? Okay. They all say, because my parents taught me like this, our scriptures talk about presence of God, our religions, our elders, our community, they say there is God. So belief system is created or indoctrinated in a dogmatic format in, on our psyche. Right? Now, <clears throat> if I put Question differently. Do you believe in sun, moon, and stars? You don't have mm -hmm. to believe them because you see them. Mm -hmm. Right? So in yoga, there is this aspect of go beyond your belief, meaning experience the higher presence in you. And once you do experience the presence, then belief becomes redundant. We hide wearing the masks of belief. Mm -hmm. We hide behind those masks of religions, the belief system. Yoga is many step, or the spirituality is many step ahead of it. Say experience. And now, to my understanding, even experience is limited, though it is better than mere belief system. How so? Because whatsoever be your experience, it is always temporary. It is in, in that moment. You know, many people, they say, I've been to Dwarka, or I've been to Banaras, or I've been to Ayodhya, you know, the recent Rama temple. And they bow their head down. Some people, they say, I went to Makar and did my hus and all that. And these experiencings can be mesmerizing. Are they real or are they emotional? We have to see that. The difference between the real experience versus indoctrinated, cultivated experience there, there are sometimes experiences arising out of merely doing your duty. It says, it, your heart says, oh, I have done my part. And that's enough. And that gives you some level of contentment. But this is again also is fabricated. For example, if you are habituated to do the namaskaram and do the lighting and worship in front of a statue or a murti. And there may be a day when you forget it. What happens to your mind then? You become restless. Oh, I could do not, I could not, I did not, I could not, I did not do this. So fear starts. It's like the cat crossing your road. Yeah. <clears throat> so, my point is, experiencing something even momentarily is better than mere belief system. But that experience is not all that great either. I have to move beyond the experiences. Let me explain to you how, 
what I'm trying to say, that when you are in the company of your very wealthy friend on a special island, you know, your, your own island, and you spend three months with your friend, right? what would you be thinking in the heart of your heart? Oh, this is great. My friend is wonderful. I'm enjoying this. I'm experiencing this. Rich hospitality. But deep down in your heart, you would still be thinking, I wish I was also rich. So divine experiences can be great, ecstatic. But to become divine is yet another matter. So experiencing divine and becoming divine, experiencing godliness and becoming godly. Okay. Even if you think at that time you, that my journey is complete, but it's still not complete. It's much ahead because the you are still cognizant, you are still aware, you are still carrying the burden of knowledge of being godly. You have to go beyond that and let go of it. Remove this burden also that you are godly. And the journey continues until you arrive at perfect negation, bakai baka. So, belief system, okay, youth should believe in things only after experiencing. You can respect your elders and say, okay, I do believe in what you do, but I like to experience what you are saying. And once you have experienced, then you don't have to motivate anyone. It's just self fulfilling, self-inspiring exercise then, then forward. See? Thank you. Thank you, Tanvi. Thank you, Daddy. Dr. Ali. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've been rehearsing this phrase for this day. May I have a vinamr uh, prathna, a humble request. <laughs> vinamr prathna is granted. Is granted <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, my parents are from Hyderabad. My forefathers are from Hyderabad. I was born in Pakistan, but I, and now I live in US, and I would love to come and see you in Hyderabad one day. That's one of my dreams. I joined this journey six months ago. Thank you. Thank you. I joined this journey six months ago and me and my wife both are, are found of you. We love you and we have seen every video <laughs> available where you speak and give us the wisdom. So I am a retired professor of psychiatry. I used to teach for 30 years. And my question is that uh, I see so many intersecting lines and overlapping areas between psychiatry and spirituality. And um, uh, how can I, if you could guide me, how can I use my talent as a teacher now as I don't teach uh, and be useful for the mission of heartfulness meditation? Thank you, Dachi. Thank you, Dr. Ali, and your dear wife. I forgot your name, uh, your wife's name. Sarvat Zehra Sarvat. 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 Sampada. Uh, wealth. Sarvat. S A R W A T. Or oh, Sarvat. Oh, Sarvat. Oh. Not Sarbat. <laughs> okay. okay. 
Well, it will be wonderful to have your input uh, in bridging the modern science or the modern approach in psychiatry and understand spirituality from the scientific perspective. See, uh, it's a very deep science. Um, psychiatry or the modern psychology has yet to scratch, <laughs> they have not even scratched the surface of uh, you know, the spirituality, even fundamental things like what is consciousness, they still fumble in defining what consciousness is. <laughs> and spirituality is much, much, much ahead of it because it can uh, help us understand consciousness and sail through the various levels of consciousness. Psychiatry, psychological studies, all these are related to consciousness only. And mostly the aberrations in the consciousness that is reflected in the mental diseases, emotional uh, turbulences. The root cause is always samskaras, the impressions. Always. Whether these impressions are from previous lives or from this life, either self-created by oneself or influenced by the external situation, parents' habits, for example, good, bad, parents' thoughts during this, you know, period of nine months of mother's thoughts, father's feelings, they all affect the child, the embryo that is growing within. Not much focus has been given to how we not only inherit DNA chromosomes, but we inherit something beyond all that, the traits, the habits, the culture. attitudes, especially attitudes, that is also partially inherited from parents. And how to neutralize it, how to filter it, knowingly my defects, how I can uh, lead a life to prevent my defects from percolating to my next generation. See? So, and that can happen only at the moment of conception. And how to, because you, most of us, they are not aware of the moment of conception anyway. So how to safeguard oneself so that any time there be conception, it should be the perfect one. So this any time should become all the time, that attitude of myself. And that should be deeply engraved, deeply connected with our inner self. So there is a mating in an ordinary animalistic way, or mating consciously with immense love, with, with gratefulness to God for having such a partner. Then I think the soul that is being attracted will have a different frequency, different level of understanding and everything else. I think that's where you can help to the research. The How to cultivate the attitude of parents so as to have the next generation better than the present one. But this is a long-term study. Please think over it. It can it start, can with, start us, with us and it can and go it can. on into hundreds of years after us. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali and Sar Sar Sarva. Sarva. I, I can't hear you, Dr. Sarva. 
Thank you so much, Daji. Thank you so much for this wonderful experience and uh, opportunity. Uh, Daji, mm, I'm a poet and ER physician. And uh, I believe that any kind of creative work needs some kind of istirab, some restlessness. And um, if things are calm and relaxed, within myself because of heartfulness and meditation like it is gradually happening with me now how can i uh, remain uh, creative and how meditation affect this creative process can you help me thank you well my answer would also be in the words of my guru babuji he, he was saying, you know, each time you change your task, each time you change your work from one work to another, when you're transitioning, connect yourself with the master. And to others, he have suggested that whatsoever I'm going to do next is dedicated to the Lord. Another one is, another approach is when we meditate in the morning and there is a leftover condition, spiritual condition that you have, you hold on to it and work with that condition. When you are about to write few words of your poetry, close your eyes for a few seconds and then let the work begin. <laughs> And that's what I do also in my life. Suppose I have to take water. I connect myself and drink. <laughs> so the drinking water is not any longer simply to fulfill your physical thirst or physiological thirst. But while drinking water, when you are connected with your guru in a, such a loving manner, I think the vibration changes. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Thank you. Master, would you like to take one more question or? We we'll take take one more, maybe two questions. Okay. Dr. Badia Wajid has joined, so I would like her to unmute and ask her question. Okay. Good morning, Daji. Good morning, um, Daji. I missed my opportunity to greet you appropriately a few moments ago because my internet just would not agree. But I am so humbled <laughs> to be here today in your presence. Um, my, I, am, I am a retired um, university professor and my area was education, I should say is education, in helping to understand how people learn, how people go from not knowing to knowing something. But my question today has to do with chakras and the merging and adaptation that occurs with the chakras as we embark upon and progress on our inner journey. Uh, would you please share information about the merging and adaptation that occurs? Thank you. Before anything can happen, you know, if I have to find my beloved, I can't be hunting for my beloved on the planet called Mars or Jupiter. I have to look for my beloved here below, the same planet I belong to. Okay. Then what's the next step? What do you do with your beloved? You have to develop 
proximity, nearness. How near would you like to be? You can rub your shoulders. Is it near enough? There are moments when you are with your beloved, it's not enough even to rub the shoulders. In fact, that creates even more thirst, more restlessness in you. So the element of emotion, element of emotional connect, the spiritual connect is so important. You can be, it's like, you can be oil drop floating on the ocean. You are intimately connected with the ocean, but you are still the oil and the ocean is water. You can never merge, you can never mix. So the object has to become equal to or similar to the subject we call the Lord. The godliness that God has and humanity that I possess, that humanity has to uplift itself a little bit more and more and more. And one day this it will be matching, it will be resonating. So, nearness creates some sort of osmosis where we begin to imbibe the quality. You must have done the experiment on osmosis perhaps in your school days. And there is a layer in between and how the isotonicity is brought about. When the tonicity becomes equal, till, until then, there will be flux of solvent and solute. You know? now, that's what they say in, in the chemistry or experiments. So similarly, you can be in osmosis, yet there is no perfect merger as yet. Oil drop is floating on the ocean. Though absolutely connected, yet it has not merged. So for oil to merge, it must become like water. I must become so loving. God, one of the definitions of God, God is love. And when I develop that love, it's no longer I'm loving specifically so and so, but I myself have become love, love personified then that merger becomes instantaneous. And the practice of meditation is to bring about this understanding. Cleaning is to purify myself so that my purity or his purity can descend in my heart. See? Yeah. And my heart becomes so simple and pure Godliness begins to descend itself. We don't have to invite God or we don't have to go to heaven. It's, it descends on its own. And that heavenly manna, as they call it, heavenly uh, essence, is always restless like the roaring oceans to descend into such hearts. So our job is to prepare our heart, how to simplify and purify our heart and create a love which is not restricted to so and so, but becomes more universal. You know, this is also a difficult concept. For example, <clears throat> people say, what is love? It's very difficult to subject again because it's after all an experience. My love towards my mother, love towards my father, love towards wife, love towards children, grandchildren, my neighbors, my colleagues, is different. 
the expression of love that I have for the spouse will never be the same that I have for my grandchildren. Though I love them all, but the expression changes. My love towards the people whom I know and people whom I don't know, expressions will be different. That doesn't mean I am uh, choosing how to love each one of them. That softness, that tenderness, that connectedness will always be there. Because whatsoever you do is from the heart now, see. It becomes a habit, becomes your second nature. So, though, you know, many people used to laugh at me, at least during my college days when I was young and all my friends were also very young and I would sit and meditate for, you know, as much as I could. And they were, my friends used to laugh at me, say, what, you're wasting your time closing your eyes. But something magical happens which transforms you from inside. Your inner being changes, your inner personality changes once and for all, see. Of course, this change is very slow. Because our adaptation to this change is also slow. 